My name is Tatum. I'm going to be your host today for our webinar on five practical steps to scaffold lessons for English learners. Um, I want to take a moment to thank the EdWeb community for hosting us today. Um, please join the EdWeb community. It's free. You can access it at www.edweb.net slash ELL. That's where you're going to be able to find a copy of the recording after the webinar has finished and also the slides and chat logs. Um, also, lots of great discussions going on there and other free resources. Great. So very exciting part. Now we get to introduce our amazing panelists. Diane, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you so you can introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, um, I'm Diane Sterfenner, and I'm the co-author of Unlocking English Learner's Potential, uh, as well as a couple of other books. And I'm a former ESL teacher and administrator who spent most of my time in Fairfax, Virginia, which is the 10th largest school district in the U.S. And currently, I'm the president of Support Ed, and we're a woman-owned small business based in the Washington, D.C. area. And we provide services only targeted at English learners. That's where our passions lie. So we provide professional development, curriculum and assessment assistance, and technical assistance to school districts, states, and the US Department of Education. And I'm really happy to be here. Thanks. All right, Heather, I'm, turn it over to you. I'm Heather Anderson. I'm a nationally board certified teacher, and I'm the 2016 Oregon Teacher of the Year. I've been teaching for 18 years in Montgomery County, Maryland, and it, now I live in Bend, Oregon. And during that time, I've always taught EL students as a classroom teacher and as an interventionist. Awesome. And again, I'm Tatum Omari. I'm going to be your host today. I am the head of curriculum and content at education.com. Been lucky enough to work with our panelists, both Diane and Heather, on the development of our EL curriculum. So we are all really excited to be here today. So for today's lineup, we just finished our welcome. Um, next is going to be Diane going deep into the five steps for scaffolding a lesson for ELs. Heather's then going to follow up with some practical application um, in the classroom and different ideas that you can leave here with today. Um, I'm going to be following up with some new tools and resources that we are offering on education.com. And at the very end of this webinar, we have a very, very exciting giveaway where we are going to pick two attendees to receive a copy of Diane's book and also a year-long premium subscription to education.com's website. <laughs> All right, so to get us started, we'd love to get a better idea of who's currently in attendance today. So please let us know what role you currently hold in your district. We have a couple different options, ESOL teacher, content or grade level teacher, instructional coach, or administrator. So we'll just take a couple of seconds while we wait for this to come up. It looks like we have a big percentage of ESOL teachers, 40, oh, it's going down. Let's see. Looks like we have about 38% ESOL teachers in attendance. The numbers are still moving like mad, so <laughs> maybe I shouldn't read out the results just yet. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds, and I'm going to close the poll so the numbers stop changing on me. <laughs> <laughs> Very great. Awesome. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll so we can look at the results. Oh, and they, they went away. So <laughs> it was about 38% <laughs> is what we had with ESOL teachers. It's very exciting. I'm glad that we have so many in attendance today. All right, so we'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Diane, so that we can get great. our slides. Thank you. So I'm going to talk today about five practical steps to scaffold lessons for English learners. And for each step I'll give you, I'm going to share a tool um, that then we will be sharing with you um, a couple of days later. You'll get a, a handout with all of the materials from today. Oops, and I'm clicking the wrong button to advance my screen, and now I'll actually advance it. So I do want to start out by saying that you can't just provide strategies in a vacuum. It has to be part of a systematic approach to providing English learners an equitable and excellent education. And in our book, Unlocking English Learners Potential, we share five guiding principles that really frame all of our work with English learners. And I'm just going to quickly highlight each one of those principles. The first is that we have to operate from a strengths perspective when it comes to English learners. So our first principle is that L's bring many strengths to the classroom, always recognizing our students' strengths in their home language, in their culture, in their approach to education. For example, it's so easy to get into the deficit perspective, but as English learner teachers, and um, advocates, we really have to start with those strengths and always be touting our English learner strengths and assets. 
Our second principle is that L's learn best when they're taught in a welcoming and supportive school climate. So we have to think of really providing a safe space for not only our English learners, but also our families so that they feel safe, they feel um, happy to take risks with the language, that they develop trusting relationships with teachers and also administrators. Our third principle is that L should be taught language and content simultaneously. So gone are the years where teachers sometimes waited for Ls to be proficient in the language before they would introduce challenging content. Well, now we know that, uh, you know, our research shows that we have to do both. We have to teach them academic language and content at the same time so they can achieve challenging content and advance academically. Our fourth principle is that L's benefit when their teachers collaborate to share their expertise. So I'll be getting into that a little bit more in our presentation, but we know that just like our students, we as educators bring so many strengths that we need to leverage and really work from each other's strengths to design very effective lessons and provide an equitable education for our L's. And finally, we know that L's excel when their teachers leverage advocacy and leadership. Um, so all of these strategies, again, they don't take place in isolation or in a vacuum. We have to advocate and we have to leverage our leadership skills to collaborate and to use these strategies and to, to really look at their effectiveness and always revise and always be on a path towards continuous improvement with, with ourselves as well as with our students. And so our work today, my section of the presentation is framed around two chapters in my uh, best-selling book, co-authored with my longtime colleague and ESOL teacher, Sydney Snyder. Um, and there are two chapters are highlighted here. The first is scaffolding instruction for ELS, and the fifth, which is teaching academic language to ELS. So I'll highlight a little bit of both of those chapters in very quick, quick way, but we hope we can continue our conversation uh, ongoing on this topic. So my presentation is structured in four pieces. Uh, the first piece is we'll look at what scaffolding is and why it's important. The second piece is we'll explore the five steps for scaffolding, excuse me, lessons for L's. The third piece is that we'll discuss collaboration. And the fourth little chunk is that we'll have a brief time for some questions and answers that Tatum will be fielding. So let's take a look first at why scaffolding for L's really is essential. And we'll start by having you um, in your attendee chat uh, answer this question. How do you define scaffolding for L's? And as you do that, I'll take a little drink of water. <laughs> so again, enter into the chat box. How do you define scaffolding for L's? <clears throat> Here we go. <laughs> Uh, some are saying breaking it down into parts, building vocabulary, giving them looking at previous knowledge, visuals, um, again, looking at vocabulary, bridging the gap, simplifying, building bridges, chunking. Uh, I see visuals again, realia. These are all wonderful, wonderful definitions of scaffolding. And so keep them, keep them coming. Let's see how quickly we can all read. This is the fastest moving chat I have ever, ever seen in all the webinars I've ever I, done. So congratulations. You were able to pull from that, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just to share a little bit about, you know, what scaffolding is and how it's defined, we want to make sure we're all kind of on the same page in terms of, you know, what, what we think of as scaffolding. And you can see in the visuals here on this slide of, the, of what scaffolds can look like. So we know that scaffolds first and foremost are temporary. So they serve as temporary supports for English learners um, and that they really support students being able to perform a task that they could not do with a little extra lift. Um, they also facilitate students being able to complete tasks independently. And that's the goal is to not only use scaffolds, but to lose scaffolds. As my colleague Tanya Ward Singer would say, we want to use them and then lose them so that our students can complete these tasks independently. So that is indeed the goal of scaffolding. And they can also be differentiated um, with, in terms of English language proficiency level, which I'll get into, get into in a little bit. So it's helpful also to look at what categories of scaffolds are. And this is adapted from WIDA's, the WIDA Consortium Framework. And we have three categories of scaffolds, which are materials and resources. Um, and it's hard to see under my <laughs> instruction. 
and also student grouping. And I'll look in a little bit next in terms of what, what scaffolds kind of belong in each group. So some examples of scaffolds. Um, if scaffolds typically that teachers tend to think of when we work with teachers are materials and resources. People just naturally start to think of like graphic organizers or visuals, word walls or word banks. Those are materials that we give to students to use in a classroom that the teacher creates. Instructional scaffolds are more like what the teacher does during instruction. So the teacher can pre-identify or pre-teach vocabulary, provide concise background knowledge instruction. I saw many of you answer that. Um, they can also try to repeat or paraphrase or model language to try to kind of reduce the linguistic load on our students without watering down the language, which is really, or the rigor, which is very important. And also teachers can uh, student, use student grouping as a form of scaffolding or support. They can thoughtfully bring students together in pair work, group work, or for example, teacher-led uh, small groups or pairs as well. So now that we've had kind of a common definition of what scaffolding is and how it can be organized, let's take a look now at strategies to plan for scaffolded lessons of L's. Let me advance this here. So the five steps that we will touch on today, just on very briefly in our short amount of time together, are here. First is to know your L's. Next is to identify the language or skills students might need in the lesson. Third is to plan the lesson, and I'll show you a little bit more about that later. Fourth is to select and develop appropriate materials, and then you finally teach the lesson, adapting scaffolding and materials as you go, and also reflecting on this. And it is an iterative process. So once you get down to number five, you'll start again with number one and always completing the process and always um, continuously improving your materials. So the first step is to know your L's. So this is an example of a tool and you'll be receiving the full tool in a couple of days in a, in a handout here. And our tool to help us get to know our L's, as I mentioned earlier, it's so important to operate from the assets perspective of L's. So it's, it's very crucial to know who our students are, what each of them is coming with. What are their countries of birth, for example? Um, what's their proficiency like in English? What's the proficiency like in the home language? How literate might they be in the home language? And this is really important information that we'll use when we're planning instruction for L's. And not only their language and proficiency, but also what are their motivations? What, what interests them? What do they do outside of school? What might their family be like? And not just one person should be gathering this information. It really should be a group effort that you can gather this information and share it with other teachers when you're planning lessons, share it with administrators. Um, it, it really helps ground us in each of our students as a person, as a whole person, and not just a, a test number. Our second step is to analyze the academic language demands of the materials we're going to be working with and the content. So I'm going to give you a little fun exercise here. So take a look at this problem and type in your chat box what might be challenging about this for English learners. It's adapted from an authentic test problem um, that, that we took. So look at this and read it. Um, I'll read it out loud for you too. Addison wants to ride her scooter more than 100 kilometers this month. She's already ridden her scooter 12 kilometers. Which inequality could be used to determine the mean number of kilometers, km, she would need to ride her scooter each day for 20 more days to achieve her goal, right? I'm seeing people say, you know, what's a kilometer? What's an inequality? You know, there are no visuals here. The abbreviation, km, this is wordy. The math vocabulary in general, they might not know what a scooter is. All of these things, even the word, the name, Addison, when I see Addison, I'm, I'm studying math, right? So I might think add. Oh, do I have to add here? Wait, but the name is, this is Addison. I don't, I don't get what I'm supposed to be doing. So, you know, this is just a little tip of the iceberg, right? Of what our L's will encounter just on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's really helpful to kind of unpack some of this academic language demands when we scaffold lessons. So when we're analyzing academic language demands, we want to look at four different levels. So we'd like to look at the word level or vocabulary, what's happening with academic language at the sentence level, at the discourse level, and in the sociocultural context. We're going to unpack that a little bit here. 
and academic language is so important not only for English learners but for all students. So if you're working, you know, uh, working with different sets of, of students, a lot of these strategies and these definitions will apply and help not only your English learners but also some of your general education students who might be struggling and a little bit and need some more support. So academic language is uh, it contrasts with our everyday informal, more colloquial speech. It's more abstract, complex, nuanced, and less contextualized, like that problem we just saw. Without knowing what a scooter is, for example, or who Addison is, you know, you might not get the full picture. And most importantly, and you know, where I uh, really tend to focus a lot of my work as an advocate, it's also the language of power. So to do a job interview or a college interview or to connect with a teacher, you really have to be able to speak this uh, academic language that is um, you know, recognized in schools. So to give you more of a visual representation, I love visuals. It's a great scaffold for everyone, including us as educators. Here's how we can think of academic language. And again, this is adapted uh, from the WIDA consortium. At the very center, we see vocabulary. So that's language is not just vocabulary, but are holding that together is the grammar and syntax at the sentence level. Holding, framing that as the organization or discourse level. How do you know? How does a text hang together? How do you connect paragraphs? What does, um, for example, a science, uh, a, a lab report look like as compared to a, a, narr a narrative, for example? Um, and then all of this happens within kind of the sometimes hidden sociocultural context. So, what are students bringing with them? What's their background knowledge on a particular topic? What are our expectations for our English learners? Do we let them use the home language in their classroom, for example? There are lots of things to think about. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over a couple of pieces here just so that we all have enough time for our presentations, but you can come back and think about some guidelines for selecting academic vocabulary for instruction, which is research-based. Um, this is kind of gives guidelines on how do you get the most bang for your buck in selecting um, academic vocabulary when you have very limited time. Also, we'd like to focus on supporting ELLs at the sentence level. So really pulling out, for example, grammar mini lessons. Some of us are not as comfortable with grammar, but there are things that you can focus on that will help all students, such, such as, you know, looking at verb tenses or prepositions or pulling out, you know, areas that you see multiple students might have some, you know, some challenges with to provide extra support. We also need to support ELLs at the discourse level. So have them look at different text structures, having them, for example, analyze the sequence of a text. What comes first? What comes next? Kind of breaking apart sentences into sentence strips and putting them back together, but citing and pointing out to them, you know, markers such as first, then, next, which tell us how, how a paragraph or a longer piece of text will hang together, um, and giving them tools to support their discourse development, like paragraph frames and graphic organizers. To really make this academic language visible to students is so important and crucial. Um, so our step two tool that I'll be sharing with you is an analysis tool to, to look at some text or some material and help, help you determine what are some areas that might be challenging for ELLs, and then how can I scaffold or address these areas in my instruction? They'll help you and colleagues take a deeper look at what might be going on in a text to, that might challenge our, our English learners. And step three is to actually plan the lesson. So in looking now, you know, and then pulling in some scaffolds, and again, this will all be shared with you in a handout where you'll have a bigger font, for example, to see everything in its entirety. These are just some screenshots. Um, at different levels of proficiency, what are some scaffolds that we can recommend? Because it can be a little daunting to start out in scaffolding when you're working with L's at different levels of proficiency. So we have some scaffolds we might recommend at the beginning level, again, easing up on those scaffolds a little bit at the intermediate level. But then there are some scaffolds that will be beneficial for all levels like providing some concise instruction and background knowledge, glossaries, dictionaries, providing materials in the home language if students are literate in their home language, for example. 
Step four is in planning is selecting and developing materials. So, you know, when you're thinking of materials you'd like to include, think of, you know, L's, we definitely want to provide the materials that are at their level, but also we want to balance that with having them access grade level content materials because we can't just only give them easier materials. We have to really scaffold grade level materials so they have an idea of what they should be working towards as they develop English. So that balance to me is always very important. And finally, we're teaching the lesson. So the, the tool here that'll align with this final step in the process is a checklist that kind of synthesizes a lot of the areas I already talked about. So, um, you know, making sure that we've selected and pre-taught some vocabulary, that we're looking at different areas of academic language, that we're scaffolding instruction and materials, for example. Um, and this is a checklist and there are 10 criteria on it that you'll receive access to after the webinar. And you can use these as a self-reflection tool or you can use these uh, together with, with colleagues when you're planning lessons, just to see, you know, it's a quick and easy way to see if you're on track with some of these areas that I've discussed. And finally, I want to make sure that I highlight how important collaboration is in scaffolding for L's. And I'd like to you know, share this, this quote with you. When teachers successfully collaborate, they're able to leverage their specific expertise in the complex tech task of supporting L's language and content knowledge. So just like our students you know, come with different strengths and we want to find out what they are and really support them, the same is true for us as teachers. It can be, you know, it can be very challenging to scaffold lessons for L's, but when we come together and collaborate, we can really find out what each person brings to the table and go from those strengths. So some options for collaboration, because I know it's not always built into, you know, your, your daily planning to have these opportunities, opportunities to collaborate are, are here. Just some, some ideas of what you can do to be creative when you're not only, not always given ample time. So for example, one thing I'd like to highlight is you can observe each other teaching L's. And this is, can be really powerful just to, Get out of your classroom if you can during a planning period or maybe find a sub and watch someone else teaching else and discuss you know what went well what can you improve sharing information about else thinking of that step one tool that i shared what do i know about my english learner so sharing that with other colleagues planning together either in person or online you know kind of on the fly even though you might not have a, a time and a space to get together and do this in person so we're gonna, that was a very quick run through of these five steps. Normally we would have a full day together to talk about this, but it's great to hopefully give you some new ideas. But we'd like to um, take a poll of which step resonated with you the most. And our poll is open right now. So go ahead and click on the step that resonated with you the most. I'll leave it open for a minute here. And it looks like identifying the language or skills students will need is kind of coming a little strong, just a little bit stronger than knowing your L's. I'm not sure what I need to do so this doesn't disappear. And I'd like to be able to share this poll with everyone. So, Edweb, any hints? Oh, I think I just share it. Did I share it? It says you can just tell the results. Uh, I can just tell the results. Got it. Okay, so definitely step two, half of you said step two. Great. Awesome. So, All right, time for Q&A, Diane. We have lots of questions. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, so one that came up is how do you support other teachers with consistent word usage? For example, introductory paragraph versus background information. I think that's referring to different terminology that might be used between teachers. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Tatum? So it says, how do you support other teachers with consistent word usage? What I got from that was, again, the need for consistency among how teachers are labeling yeah. things. Yeah. yeah, I think that, that really comes from the collaboration piece and you know having meetings and deciding together as a group 
across a grade level, for example, or a content area, we're going to use this term and we're going to use it consistently because you're you're right. That can that can be a real source of confusion for students if they're hearing different words with different teachers. You know, especially at the um, at the secondary level, because you know, if you have seven different subjects, you have it's like working for seven different bosses, right? And you want to know what each expects and the terminology that each uses. So definitely, the planning piece that will be the time to to have these conversations and to build that consistent terminology into your materials. Got it. Next one. So it says, when scaffolding, is it something the EL should teach teachers should be doing for the mainstream lessons that the mainstream teacher is teaching, or should the classroom teachers be scaffolding their own? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Okay. So we ideally would like everyone to be scaffolding, right? So um, you know, I really like to highlight that English learners are everyone's kids, right? They not only belong to the ESOL or ESL or ELD or bilingual teacher, but they are also belonging to the uh, general education or content teacher as well. So when we're planning to scaffold, it's great for the uh, ESL or EL teacher to share some scaffolding ideas, but to then also provide supports for content teachers so they can then be doing this on their own because Usually uh, English learners spend the majority of their day in the content classes without ESL support. The next one is, what about translators in the classroom? How do you recommend um, collaboration with translators? Great, so it's wonderful if you are in a position where you have um, another professional, like a paraprofessional, instructional assistant in your room um, to be able to provide translation. Um, definitely, you'd have to use them judiciously, and I would have them, for example, working with smaller groups of students, but also to let the student, students uh, try to, to um, have a bit of a productive struggle, a scaffolded productive struggle, where they are making sense of the English, not just providing the translation right away, because then there's less motivation for the students to make sense of what they're learning in English. So in terms of using, having interpretations, um, and I think you're referring to having a person in the classroom, um, not a written translation. So in terms of um, having a, a, another professional with you, you know, definitely focus on those words and phrases and information to translate. That'll help give students a quick on-ramp to the meaning, to the content being discussed. Great. So let's see our next one. There were a couple of questions that came in and they were hoping that you could repeat the title of your book. Oh, I'm happy to. Um, it's called, and if we had a quick way to go back to the slide, I would, but I don't know the number. It's called Unlocking English Learners Potential. And I will type that into the chat. Great. All right, so when you have an ELL student, should you speak to them in their home language at all or only in English? Oh, it really depends. Um, I liked personally, you know, I've kind of done it both ways. I speak Spanish and German, although I've never really used much German in the classroom. But I, I like to be able to connect with students and to have them know that I speak the language. So, you know, to develop that level of trust. Um, but also, you, you also have to, it's a balance again, right? You have to be careful of using too much. So we want to honor the home language, honor the culture. Sometimes I would provide a, you know, a little translation for a student, you know, on a concept like photosynthesis, where I know they know it in their home language, it might be a cognate, just mentioning it in the home language to have a quick, you know, a quick, aha, oh, I know that I've learned it already to then be able to move on to the content, if that makes sense. So last one before we move on to okay. Heather. Great. Um, how do you suggest managing all the different scaffolds when multiple students need different types of support? Right, and that comes down to, to having a plan and being organized and, uh, you know, just also noting that you can't use every scaffold with every student, right? And just kind of working on a system that works for you, trying maybe one or two different scaffolds for a student, seeing what kind of scaffolds you can give to all students, such as, you know, I, I showed you some scaffolds that are effective with all, like visuals and graphic organizers are a scaffold that would be beneficial for all students, including L's, but not limited to English learners. Great. That one went pretty quick. I'm going to give one more too, because <laughs> okay. one, one other really one, a good one that came up. 
How would you recommend um, collaboration between classroom teachers and ELL teachers who push into the classroom? Yeah, that, it, you know, that situation, which is a, a wonderful situation, um, and we're currently working with a couple of school districts on collaboration and co-teaching projects. So we know that co-teaching is kind of like an arranged marriage sometimes, right? You have to, you might not always choose who you get to co-teach with, but um, you have to really collaborate and communicate to, to make it work. So it's really crucial to define what the roles will be beforehand. So who will be doing what? Will you be both in front, and there are many different models of co-teaching as well. Will you be in both in front of the classroom at the same time? Will you be working at different small groups? How will you structure that? So having a plan is really the most important key. And also recognizing that both of you are bringing a lot of expertise so that you don't want the person pushing in. And I don't really, I'm not a big fan of the term pushing in because it sounds really pushy. Um, so the person, <laughs> so the person who is coming in to, to collaborate and support, you want to make sure that both of them are seen as experts um, and as, you know, bringing their own expertise, not as one at a high, one is the teacher and one is the assistant, if that makes sense. All right. I think that wraps up our Q&A session with Diane. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and advance and Heather, I'm going to let you take over from here. All right. Thank you so much, Diane, for those amazing strategies. First of all, I wanted to let all the teachers on here know that our job is hard and we are asked to do an amazing amount of things in one day. And the wonderful part is that we do it and we make a difference in children's lives. And so one quote that um, I live by that my principal always says is keep it simple, focus on growth. So no matter if I'm working with a whole class or a small group of kids or one child, I know where I'm taking that child and I'm going to keep it simple and then look at the growth that they make along the way and celebrate those successes. That way, just taking a minute to slow it down in the classroom or in your small group setting really allows you to see where your child come, has come from and where they're going and recognize sometimes that growth that isn't seen on uh, progress monitoring or a formative assessment or those kind of things. So I would encourage you to celebrate those successes along the way. So I followed Diane's model here and thought about each of her steps to how they would apply in a classroom setting. And so I really, the first one really resonates with me about the importance of knowing your EL students, knowing every child in your classroom, creating that welcoming environment, making sure that you are relating with every child in your room and spending time to build those relationships. Kids don't learn very well from people they don't have a strong relationship with or they don't get along with. Um, so making sure that you show that child that you care will really help you in the end run to help that child succeed and grow. And also valuing the background of the child, the language that's spoken at home, and encouraging involvement from the entire family in our classrooms and in our schools is really important with our EL students, with every child as well as knowing that level of what ELL level the child is and what they are able to do, but of what you need to build up and teach them in the classroom with content, as well as their language proficiency. And like Diane said, we wanna make sure our ELs are exposed to the higher depth of knowledge questions and content, but still that we need to scaffold that support so that it can be accessible for those students. Um, step two, just within the language skill that needs to be developed, it's important that these skills are aligned with their ELL level and with the goal of the lesson. And this is where that collaboration comes in. You need to be talking with your ELL teacher if you're the classroom teacher, or you need to be talking with the classroom teacher if you're the ELL teacher. I'm the interventionist right now, and I make sure that to communicate with both classroom teachers and ELL teachers because I see those EL children in my setting. And so we really work together to make sure we're providing the best support necessary or the best support available for each child, but keeping in mind of their language proficiency levels, even though I'm going to be teaching reading or and someone else is going to be t working on them with science skills and those things, but we have the child's best interest at heart. 
And then realizing that sometimes you have to teach those skills several times and it allow for it to build from one small skill to the next, and that it's not going to just happen overnight. This is a lot of effort to help a child learn another language and that it's worth it, but you do have to be persistent and um, systematic in the way that you're teaching those skills. Within step three, planning the lesson, I find that routines are key. You want to have predictable um, procedures and routines for your EL students so that they know what to expect and they're not gonna be anxious about what's gonna happen next. I know that after there's a mini lesson, I'm gonna go back to the back table and work with the teacher on my writing or I'm gonna go and work independently or the routines that are just built in each day to keep the child in a comfortable environment to be able to learn. And then the real importance of having it hands-on and developmentally appropriate if we allow for our children to have manipulatives, visuals, videos, um, pre-teaching when, when available, and that every new skill that they learn, especially in the elementary grades, they have the opportunity for a visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and tactile experience that will help them to retain the concepts. One of the highest leverage uh, EL skills I find in the classroom that I use on a regular basis is the pre-teach model. I'm in a setting where I can pre-teach the vocabulary to my EL students before they see it in the classroom. And that really helps that when they go in for the next week, we've already gone over some of the academic vocabulary. We maybe have gone over the vowel combinations for the week. Um, they've had an experience with the text before they see it in the classroom. And we're finding that they're able to be more confident when they're in the classroom and access the material. Um, better by having that pre-teach model. And then selecting the appropriate materials. Every child is different. It's very hard to say, you know, scaffold is necessary. Of course we know that, but we know that we're also scaffolding for a group of six or a group of 30 or different, depends on your setting. And you want to get, use that scaffold until the child does not need it. And then the goal is that they can be independent with it. I have found a lot of success um, utilizing educational technology when planning with EL students, depending on what programs you use or are willing to find online. There's read to options. There's um, highlight options that read along with the students. There's vocabulary and pre-taught where you can click on the vocabulary and see a video that would help your EL student. And then there's many resources out there where you can adjust the Lexile level. So if you have a child that is wants to still read or you're gonna still read the same current event article, you could shift one down to a second grade level and a third and then still teach your class at a fifth grade level. And that way they're still getting that higher level content with um, the deep, deep connections they can make with their classmates, but the Lexile level is a little easier for them to read. And finally, um, as we teach and scaffold, we need to adjust as necessary. And that's important as a teacher to just always be a, a lifelong learner and open to making changes within our practice and within our classroom environment and to adjust with what's going to meet our students' needs at the time and as we get a different group of students, we adjust again. And so just being willing to, to grow and learn. And if you have to go back and reteach something to a group of children or one child, that's okay. Go back and reteach it until the concept is learned. And then once again, celebrate those successes, really keeping it a positive environment and encouraging your children, I find to be very helpful. And then concluding thoughts, I've, um, like I said, I've worked in a couple schools with EL students for almost 20 years now. And one of the things my school has been doing the past seven years is pro providing real world opportunities for our EL students, whether it's a cooking classes, nutrition, um, STEM club, uh, coding, Lego robotics, something that children can take and apply 
the skills that they know from school, but in a way that they can see a connection to the outside world. And I really have seen a lot of success and confidence and encouraging parents to come in and be involved um, with those real world opportunities. One of my favorite ones has been uh, that we do, a, I teach the kids how to read through knitting patterns. And then through that, we I taught them all how to knit baby hats and on a loom and they did the process and made baby hats. And then we went down and donated them to the NICU. And it was really a amazing experience because it was something that got them involved in the community it was still tied it to reading, but they were able to create something and then they got to give back and really feel appreciated um, with the, how happy the people were at the NICU to get their little baby hats that they were able to donate. So anything that can help collaborate within your community, real world experiences for your kids and just keep up those positive relationships. Great, all right, time for some questions. I we have some really good ones come up. Is everybody able to hear me? All right, so can you please share some of the educational technology resources that you recommend, Heather? Well, I use um, education.com for a lot of my first grade students and second grade students. Uh, they have some great uh, read to text on there and math games and reading games. I also like a uh, news ELA for my older students where I can adjust the uh, Lexile level up and down. And then just within my reading program that we use, I'm sure all of the big reading programs have them. We have a digital component. So um, my students are able to access, like I said, the videos and um, picture cards through any of the big, the big five. Very good. So what does it look like to pre-teach in a 50 minute class when that's all the time that you have? Uh, so I really think that um, I, I, st I follow the 10 minute mini lesson model, no matter how much time I have. Um, so I, I think kids after 10 minutes are ready to work. So 10 minutes of pre-teaching and then I would do an activity with them after that. Um, I teach in a 30 minute block. So we usually do the 10 minute of pre-teach, then they're um, working on it. And then we um, have a area where they can build their decoding skills or reading skills for the last 10 minutes. Great. How do you approach collaboration um, in the most efficient way possible? Do you have any apps or online programs um, if you can't meet face-to-face -face or any recommendations there? That's from Jennifer Silbovaro in Illinois. Well, my school, I work in a, a technology magnet elementary school, so we utilize technology. Um, we'll send each other a Voxer message back and forth, uh, which is kind of like a walkie-talkie um, if we need to talk and can't see each other in person um, after school hours, of course. But um, usually, I, I, being a specialist, try to make sure that I eat lunch with different teams so that I put myself around to get time where I can be available to the teams. And then I visit PLCs and um, we have some time on Wednesdays when I'm able to go in. Um, but in general, you just need to make it a priority. And I know that's hard to say because we're busy and there is no time. But when you know that you need to get work together with a teammate, then just saying, hey, let's pick a time in the next two weeks, let's talk about this and then we can follow up via email or something not in person. Great. So what do you suggest for an ELL instructor that is actually having difficulty getting the opportunity to push into a classroom? Uh, building that relationship with the teacher um, is important first and that trust there so that they know that when you're coming in, you're going to be willing to help and support and not, um, not there for a conflicting matter. I think that that's key. We have to work together in our schools and trust each other and know that we're all there for the best interest of kids. Great. All right. Is it okay to give picture books or lower level readers for upper grade students if their independent reading level is, is lower? Absolutely. And picture books, some of them are even at, can be written at a sixth or seventh grade level. So just because it's a picture book doesn't mean it's an easy book. Um, however, there are a lot of chapter books out there right now that are geared towards uh, second grade readers, but they look like more advanced books. Um, so some of my favorites to use for like 
fifth graders. Um, I really like the Dragon Master series and um, any of those graphic novels like the Nathan, Nathan Hale's uh, Disastrous Tales, I think they're called something like that. Um, and then any, yeah, the, I see someone over there saying Dog Breath, any of those Dog Man <laughs> or any of those kind of books that are a little bit silly, but they're graphic novels. The um, even fifth grade boys, they'll, they'll read those and they'll feel very highly proud of themselves because it's a big chapter book, but the text is really geared for a second or third grader. So I like those. Great. So do you see augmented and virtual reality tools as being useful in teaching ELs? I, I love those tools, but that's because I work in the setting. Um, one that we use, I, we use the Merge Cube, um, which is one that I think would be a great realia. Um, it's, it's very inexpensive, but the way we've used it at our school is you put it up and then you can see the whole solar system and the ELs or any student can click on Mars and it pops up all this information about it. And it's literally, they're holding the Merge Cube or Mars in their hands. So um, yeah, that's a very simple one that I would say Definitely any of those tools would be great, but Merge Cube would be a one easy one to start with. Awesome. Heather, thank you so much. That was great. And again, um, for anybody that had questions that we didn't get a chance to get to, we're actually going to be taking this to Facebook Live after the end of the webinar, um, where both Heather and Diane will join us there. If you'd like to ask more questions, you can access that Facebook Live by going to the education.com Facebook page, and we would love to to continue the conversation with you there. We'll be going for about a half an hour. All right. So next, we'd love to talk about some new tools and resources. Um, on education.com right now, we're offering to all EdWeb webinar participants a discount code that you can access with EL EdWeb 19. It's gonna be valid um, for about 24 hours after the webinar. And to give you a quick overview of the EL resources that we have on education.com, these were actually um, developed in collaboration with Diane. She helped us to envision them from start to finish. Um, all of our curriculum developers went through and a training that Diane offers through Get Support Ed that I recommend to anyone. Um, they've all read her book. We all learned amazing things from her for how to effectively um, design a curriculum that can meet the needs of people who are trying to meet both content and learning objectives, language objectives, sorry. Um, really quickly, I have all of the chats appearing over my slides. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over and give that a minute to clear up. <laughs> it was a little overwhelming. <laughs> so if you visit our EL resources page, you're going to see that we have weekly reading lessons that are actually meant for the mainstream classroom and they are paired with EL specific pre-teaching lessons. Now, when Diane and I first envisioned how this would work, we were thinking specifically about the relationship between the mainstream content teacher and also the potential ESOL push-in or pull-out teacher. And we wanted to make it easier for you to collaborate around lessons by providing both sides of that. So you do have the main content lesson and you do have the EL specific pre-teaching lesson. Um, each of those lessons do have the tiered vocabulary identified ahead of time. They also come with ready to print out visual vocabulary flashcards that we thought would be great potentially for use on a word wall or just for giving to the kids to take home so that they could practice. Um, we also have bilingual glossaries, graphic organizers, and a lot of other instructional scaffolds that we include. Um, in addition, we have some teaching templates as well. So we have a background knowledge lesson planning template and coming this spring, a couple of really existing or exciting additions to the EL curriculum, which is going to be our EL math. And we are also going to be releasing leveled books that are actually aligned to those EL reading lessons that we mentioned. The leveled books are especially exciting because we have done them so that they are multi-level. That way, if you have students that are reading below grade level, they will be reading much the same book that ch the children at grade level are reading. And those are available online and they will be linked directly to the pre-teaching and main content lessons. And actually, I'm almost forgetting one more thing. Um, we are continuously trying to recruit for those interested in field testing our curriculum. So if you have any interest in coming on our site, giving these a try, and you would like to be able to have a forum to give us feedback so, so that we can improve the lessons, you can either get in touch with me at Tatum at education.com, T-A-T-U-M at education.com, or also Martin at education.com. And again, we absolutely love feedback, so we would love to hear from you. 
after the webinar, we are also going to be sending out emails with some helpful resources that are going to include a link to Diane's book, um, the PDF checklist that you saw um, from Diane's slides, the a link to the education pre teaching education.com pre teaching EL lesson plans, the vocab analyzer, which was like one of the coolest tools that we discovered when we were creating our curriculum where you can actually go in and enter words and it will tell you what tier of vocabulary they are. <laughs> it's really amazing. Um, and then also the lesson planning template for teaching background knowledge. All right, so we thought it would be really great to end this webinar with a bit of a call to action, and we would love to hear what really resonated with you and what you are planning to do in the next five days um, where you can take the information and apply this to support your ELs. We have a couple of different options. Identify a few materials, instructional student grouping scaffolds that you can incorporate. You can check out Diane's blog on our site for um, more ideas for scaffolding instruction for English learners. You can plan a pre-teaching lesson that provides the concise instruction of background knowledge. Again, we have those templates available for you and we will be sending them out. Um, or you can check out a pre-teaching lesson and other resources on education.com. I'm really excited that a lot of people seem excited to check out the lessons on education.com. So that's really cool. And it looks like this in second with 33%, we have identify a few materials, instructional or student grouping scaffolds that you can incorporate. Um, and then we have about 50% who are excited to check out the pre-teaching lessons. That's great. I'll give just a couple more seconds. I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll. All right, wonderful. So now we are at the very exciting giveaway point of our webinar. Um, we are going to have two separate people that are both gonna be receiving copies of Diane's book, Unlocking English Learners Potential and the one year premium um, subscription to education.com. And it looks like our winners are Deborah Franklin Fiengold, and I apologize if I just said your name wrong, please forgive me, um, from New York and Susan Cook from Vermont. So we are really excited. We will be getting in touch with you via email after this webinar to make sure that we can get that book delivered to you and also that we can get you signed up with a membership to our site. Again, thank you for attending. Um, please stay in touch with us. I know that uh, both, well, all of us actually, Diane, Heather, and me would all love to hear from you. Um, you have our Twitter handles here and our personal and professional emails. You have the websites that we are associated with and our LinkedIn profiles as well. Um, please definitely get in touch. We would love to hear from you. And don't forget, you can access your um, continuing education certificate in the EdWeb community. Um, they will also be sending that to you, your personalized certificate within the next business day. And there we go. We have another um, place where you can click in and go to EdWeb's ELL community for to view this EdWeb re recording and then also other webinar recordings as well. You can ad earn additional CE certificates, download slides and chat logs, join online discussions that are happening all the time and get free resources. And that's all folks. Thank you so much for joining. It does look like we have about five more minutes left. Um, so we did end a bit early. Maybe we could go back and do a final round of Q&A. Would that sound okay for you? Um, just to kick it off and get started, Diane and Heather, and then on the hour, we'll switch over to Facebook. Does that Sounds sound good. okay? Yeah. All right. Well, I wasn't wasn't fielding the question, so let me take a look really quickly. It says, will we receive our certificate via email? That is a yes. EdWeb will be sending that out to you. And let's see. Can you give us some tips to help young learners with creative writing? Heather or Diane, I'll tell you what you can do there. Heather, I well, I, oh, I, um, I love to teach writing to young learners. I think one of the most important things is to encourage their creativity. So I'm by young learners, I'm gonna go with first kinder or first grade um, and that remembering so once again, like a 10 minute mini lesson, maybe even seven at kindergarten, and then allowing them to write, or in that case, start with drawing or those kind of ideas so that it's not such a tedious task. Um, those have been, that's what we do in our school. And then as soon as we need to, after they've written for a little bit, pull them back and confer and give them ideas. So for your EL learners, maybe they're starting with a picture and then they're putting the sounds to what the picture is. And then eventually they'd be able to start writing it into um, sentences. But I would just 
say, keep it simple, focus on growth and don't keep them sitting too long for a lesson. And I would also add that, you know, using pictures, just, you know, um, piggybacking off of what Heather said, making sure that the pictures are culturally relevant and are meaningful to them as well will really help move them along in their writing. Great. It says, can you explain your 30 minute setup? I think this one is for you, Heather. And what, what does it look like for you, this 30 minute setup? Uh, well, I'm, a inter I'm the reading and math intervention teacher this year. So my 30 minute setup for reading intervention would be when the kids come in, I have about five minutes that I'm working on a specific skill uh, such as uh, vowel combinations or whatever is missing, what they're missing. Um, so like template practice. And then I move into my instruction, explicit instruction for their reading goal. And then I spend the last 10 minutes in their decodables that are at their level. Great. I have one last one before we'll probably um, go ahead and head over to Facebook. It says, we have many newcomers from Guatemala and El Salvador entering our schools right now. Do you have any specific advice for newcomers? I can go ahead and, and start. Um, yeah, definitely, you know, making those personal connections first are so critical. And also trying to get a sense of what the home language literacy might look like, because we know that even if students have been schooled continuously in their home language, that schooling, that my idea of schooling might look differently, for example, in Central America than it does in the US. And in my teaching in Fairfax County, we also worked with a, a very large number of Central American students. And you would sometimes see inconsistencies or the school would maybe meet for a half a day instead of a full day like we would in the US. Um, so just definitely trying to get a sense of uh, what home language literacy looks like and building on the skills that they that they do bring with them. But really, you know, not being too afraid to to really get into some challenging material, keeping keeping them working at developing language through content. So, you know, having them learn language through math and through science and through social studies and providing them those scaffolds and, and support so the, the content will make sense to them and so they can relate it to something they already know. Yeah, definitely. I know when we were developing the curriculum, Diane, kind of going back to what you said, you want to use and lose the scaffolds. You know, we mm -hmm. tried really hard to think about um, what additional scaffolds we could add for beginning students and which we would start to remove for right. the more advanced students as they mm -hmm. went along. So. Yeah, that's great. All right. I think we are pretty much at the end here again. Anybody that would like to follow us over to Facebook, we'd love to continue the conversation over there. We'll probably be live um, in a, maybe a few minutes after the hour. So we will hope to see you there. And thank you again so, so much, everybody, for coming. This was really wonderful to have so many people on the line. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Diane and Heather.